Hi, uh, I'm Neha Kumar, faculty at Georgia Tech, and I'm here to proudly present the work of 17 incredible students who came together with me uh, last semester, so in the fall of 2018, um, in the form of a book club, and um, uh, to read about uh, things like culture and modernity, uh, inequality in the US, global development, and feminism. Um, so just to call out the names, some of them are here in the room, others couldn't make it. Uh, Manasi, uh, Narvilkar, uh, Josiah Mangianelli, Adriana Alvarado Garcia, Azra Ismail, Daniel Schiff, Daniel uh, Chekta, Jordan Chen, Karthik Pat, Marisol Wong de la Cres, Anusha Vasudev, Aparna Ramesh, Michael Andai, Navina Karasara, Pradipi Singh, Savanthi Murphy, Shubhangi Gupta, Udaya Lakshmi, and myself. As we read, the 18 of us brought our knowledges and also uh, the lack thereof around feminism and different kinds of feminisms to the table. And each of us grappled with these questions in different ways. Questions like, what is feminism? Do I have feminist values? Am I allowed to be feminist? When can I call myself feminist? Is feminism for me? Do I know any feminists? Where do I see feminism in my life? As an HCC student, faculty, researcher, and HCC stands for Human Center Computing. What does it mean to live like a feminist? Do I have to be like Sarah Ahmed? Must I be critical of Sheryl Sandberg? Do I care enough? Do I want my voice to be heard? The answer for most of us, and for most of these questions, was it's complicated. Unpacking this to reflect some more, we came together to do a joint deliverable as a submission for Orkai. And so um, our, our, our um, submission was really a collection of stories, and I'm going to share some of those with you. Uh, now, Sarah Ahmed, in Living a Feminist Life, talks of the importance of companion texts, and we found several along the way. Some of these resonated with us, validated us, reminded us that we're not alone. Some brought out the tensions that reside within us and among us. Each brings forth and introduces its own kind of feminism, legitimizing its own way of being. It may emphasize understanding and reflection, coping and self-care, or action and emancipation. It may focus on women in corporate settings, oops, or those living on the margins of society, individuals of particular sexual orientations, or women just more generally speaking. Our companion text served us as guides as we found ourselves aligned with no single view, interpretation, or threshold of what it means to be feminist. Our expressions, our shades of feminism, are based on our experiences. They're a consequence of navigating this world while doing the best that we can to understand and to persist. We engage with and also deviate from scholarly thought and written manifestos, relying on what we have lived, honoring the personal. Uh, Chivamanda Adichie uh, says, the consequence of the single story is this. It robs people of dignity. It makes our recognition of our equal humanity difficult. It emphasizes how we are different rather than how we are similar. Uh, notwithstanding the differences, these feminisms and others do express common ideas and values that women and other groups have been and are marginalized. That the implicit and explicit structures that govern our world have had a hand in this. That such marginalizations are variously reflected in the world of human-centered computing, and that reorienting our values and actions might help to combat them. This is what brought us to do this. As Adichie says, stories matter. Many stories matter. Stories have been used to dispossess and to malign. But stories can also be used to empower and to humanize. Stories can break the dignity of a people, but stories can also repair that broken dignity. The stories that we share with you, they move us, motivate us, challenge us, and anger us. They make us who we are. As human-centered computing students, researchers, faculty, professionals, we share them in the hope that they might bring you to reflect and to uncover the shade of feminism that fits you best. This shade may manifest as a commitment to action or the articulation of latent thought. It may be already vibrant, or it might be struggling to find definition. As a mild form of feminism, or a blend of multiple forms, the smallest step might be a radical one, and we invite you to take that step with us. Here's uh, story number one uh, by a student who um, uh, had this experience while she was doing field work for her human centered computing research. Madam, here's my number. Call me if you ever need anything. If you ever face an emergency, don't worry. 
I will not ask for your number. I will never call you. Our eyes met in the rear view mirror and I gave a tentative smile to the auto rickshaw driver. During our ride, as I headed home from my field site in Delhi, we had bonded over our mutual connection to Bihar and a nostalgia for the simple courtesy afforded there, all too often missing in Delhi, where people have loud voices and even louder opinions. But even as I recorded his number, I knew that I would never place that call. The light in my eyes dimmed a little at this realization. I felt ashamed and guilty for giving in to my fears around safety, for keeping a physical and emotional distance. And I felt angry at a society that made it difficult for a woman to have an entirely genuine interaction with a stranger. Increased reporting of cases of sexual assault have generated intense fear and suspicion particularly directed towards male blue-collar workers. I have found, however, that these men are often migrant workers living away from home just to send their families enough so that they can afford decent lives. Many of these men have shown kindness to me as a young woman traveling alone. As more and more women in India and elsewhere begin to venture outside their homes and beyond, we need to acknowledge and honor these small yet large acts of kindness and noble intent. And as we resist the impositions of patriarchal behavior, we must recognize that they not only restrict women, but also place heavy burdens on men. Let's stop clipping each other's wings uh, again as a response to structures of oppression. I had a cosmopolitan Indian upbringing, which taught me that boys and girls are equal in every way. I was a fairly rambunctious kid, unafraid to express myself in any way I wanted. I went on adventures with my friends, climbed trees, and played in the dirt. I'd occasionally get in trouble with these friends. And when both failed, I'd settle scores using fist fights. I'd be scolded and disciplined, but to no avail. One incident stands out, and is seared in my memory. One of the first talks an adult had with me was when I was six or seven years old. One of my favorite teachers sat me down and told me to stop getting into physical altercations with boys, as boys grow up, grow up to be stronger than girls, and that I might hurt myself. I remember being confused and hurt. Although I realize now that she spoke out of concern, that conversation has molded me in ways I cannot change. At major crossroads in my life, I've had to stop and think hard about what driving forces led me there. My response to being told I couldn't do something was to go do it twice as hard and not back down. I responded to the conversation with my teacher by taking up boxing in school, being the only girl to do so, becoming the sports captain after four years of representing my school at the state level, and the highest honor of all, marching at the head of the school on our annual sports day. Let's talk living each other's wings. And this is the ambition that also leads many of us into STEM education because that's the way we do it. Because that's the way we do it is the most common response I heard to questions about gender roles throughout my childhood. When I helped serve food or make tea in my grandparents' kitchen, I was praised, but my sister was expected to do so. I remember hearing my family say, in my time, girls only left the house to go to their husband's <laughs> house. Going to college was never an option then, when my sister left home for grad school. Then I remembered them saying, why did you wait until you finish your education to get married? Who will marry you now that you are a specialized doctor? They also maintained, it would be okay if she were a man, but a woman has to consider raising a family. I heard these and similar things at various child and family gatherings, constantly reinforcing my sense of opportunity as a man, downplaying the barriers my sister has had to break before she could partake in the same opportunities. I started to question these relatives, asking, why do you say that to her but not to me? And why does that make sense anymore? Questioning bad logic is one thing, but questioning decades of cultural practices is quite another. Even as I persisted to argue, the conversations always shifted to how my generation failed to respect its elders or to recognize that they always knew better. It became clear that we were fighting traditions, not logic, and I can only hope that showing empathy to the women in my life now, in both my personal and professional circles, will pay dividends for posterity. Thank God for allyship.
For me, feminism is about the privilege to be anything. Free of single stories, unapologetic for one's own stories, and respectful and celebratory of others. This definition did not start out as centered around gender or race or class, though now I often think in terms of such intersections. It started out as lack of confidence, fear of being too much, and eventually letting go of these feelings to be who I am and to have the space to be who I am. When I think about how I learned to be feminist, how I learned to be okay with being myself, there are many immediate associations. But what highlighted for me the importance of embodiment in diverse forms of feminist expression is dance. It's visceral melting of movement, emotions, and storytelling. I learned Kuchipudi and Indian classical dance for 14 years. It requires quite a bit of acting, in addition to pure rhythmic dance, and generally depicts stories from Hindu mythology. I remember being taught to beat the ground hard with my feet, becoming unafraid to make noise, sharpen my movements, practice sequences until I was confident. I remember learning to play different characters, especially powerful goddesses and women in Hindu mythology, at first afraid to show the emotion that these roles called for, and then amazed that the emotions felt so powerful and resonant. The generosity of Lakshmi when she spontaneously showered golden gooseberries upon a woman who gave away the last bit of food in her house as alms. The anger of Kali so intense that she was on the cusp of destroying the whole universe until her husband laid himself at her feet to calm her. The fatigue and frustration of Sita as she decided to return to the earth, her mother, after a life so full of injustice at the hands of men. To these movements, stories, and embodiments, I learned that I can exist in the world and that I can be anything, maybe generous, angry, or tired, without hint of apology. Over time, I learned to notice when others operated on the belief that people, particularly women, could not be anything, or perhaps only one thing, or just a few things, and this informs my feminism. How can we give each other space to be ourselves? When does someone's self take away someone else's space to be themselves? Where is the balance? And who do we choose to ask these questions of? Um, that reflection always makes my eyes moist. Um, so the next one uh, is my own, talking about the margins of privilege. Um, wow, you're a real professor. Are you really a professor? Are you the TA? You're the only female professor I know. As women of color, be prepared. But no, I wasn't prepared to hear these comments when I first became tenure track faculty. And I wasn't prepared for the moment when a dear and cherished mentor said to me that I was special because of my gender, ethnicity, and how rare the combination is in the field of computing. I struggled to respond to such remarks, no less than I had struggled to respond some years ago, sitting in a room full of senior Google executives and newly awarded Anita Board scholars on being asked, what were your experiences, subtext of marginalization, as a woman in STEM? I tried to answer, to recall the story of oppression, a story that the room was expecting to hear. I had always seen myself as privileged and felt uncomfortable, disempowered even, at the seeming imposition that there must have been such disadvantage, that there must have been um, a way that I was marginalized because I was a woman of color in computing. I thought back to the class of 200 students I had taken on digital systems design, where there were only nine other women, but no memories of feeling oppressed came to mind. The only somewhat relevant incident I could recall was when a male friend whose application to major in computer science had been rejected for the fifth time told me that I would have no problem getting in because I was a girl. To my naive self at the time, being a girl in STEM became a clear advantage then, not a point of vulnerability. Today my understanding is slightly more nuanced, but it has taken some time and many unsolicited reminders that I belong to an underrepresented group in computing. Ignorance was bliss and it made my journey a little easier. Today I find myself alter alternate between a strong sense of injustice that the world is how it is, like when James Demore's manifesto came out, and a stronger sense of determination that it must not stay this way. I realize I'm on some margin, but a margin that unequivocally intersects with privilege. Every day I aim to bring this privilege and marginality in dialogue with one another, ensuring that they work together in tandem to become drivers of change. That is what being a feminist and HCC researcher is all about to me. There are 13 more stories where these came from and you can find them in our paper, and there are many more in this room, I bet. 
Each of our stories presents a window into the lives of human-centered computing students, researchers, practitioners, where they come from, and how they are led, shaped and moved by tradition, yet ready for change. The shades of feminism they bring to human-centered computing are not singularly representative on any one kind of feminism, but rooted in many diverse backgrounds and lived experiences. And when we place them along continuums of feminist expressions, they aspire to build a future that is different, equitable, and just, whether it is by renewing attention to age-old structures of oppression or discovering in them our sources of inspiration as we define feminism for ourselves, also developing our own forms of resistance and solidarity to respond to these structures. Our hope is that these structures will inspire more among us to reflect on our own backgrounds and experiences towards an understanding of the shades of feminism that they bring to the discipline to contribute to a holistic growth of it. May many more of us be drawn to confront the expectations of tradition, combat the more and less overt institutional barriers that challenge education and embrace an activistic stance, whether it is through embracing strands of radical feminism, reinforcing liberal feminist thought, other feminisms, or a blend of several. As the teacher says, many stories matter. And we hope that you and future readers will find value in sharing and partaking of these stories, these streams of feminism, and take the next steps to express your own. So with that, I'd like to invite anyone who would like to share. Of course, questions are welcome, but we'd love to hear more stories. Thank you. I did try to plant some questions in the audience, so if anyone would like to come up. Hi, I'm Lucy. Um, yeah, I think one thing that you pointed out a little bit that I personally really feel a lot is the feeling of like, oh, am I being a bad feminist? Like, am I a bad feminist if my partner makes more money than me? Should I like drop out of grad school and really just try to like get on that money making machine so that I could be, you know, the, the right kind of like empowered woman? Um, and I think that this sort of like, uh, you know, that there's there's perhaps not a bad way, like there's not really a way you can be a bad feminist, it's like a, a freeing thing that you can make your own choices in, as an individual and it's not sort of up to you to like, you know, catch up the wage gap, it's not like on each individual woman's shoulders that she can make a choice that is like right now. <coughs> Yeah, and I want to say to that, there was one of, one of the authors on this speech, she came up to me and she said she didn't really want to be on, on the author's list at first because she felt that she didn't feel confident enough to be, like she didn't know if she was uh, confident enough in her knowledge of feminism. Mm -hmm. And it took some conversations around that to kind of say, you know, all feminisms are okay. I mean, how do we get to the point of being expert? How do we get to the point of like knowing everything? And do we all know everything about anything? Like it's all a learning process, I think. That's how I look at it. Anyone else? Yeah, I have a question. Um, so um, I, I don't know what, it's kind of an interesting uh, the story. My, my wife, uh, was an academic, and she got pregnant. She was on a uh, short-term grant. So what that meant was that um, she, her maternity leave was taken out for money, and it wasn't extended. Right? So there was no, because the idea with the maternity grant is you get someone else in, and they'll do the work for you. But in this case, no one will do it. Just so then she went back to say, well, you're actually paying me less money than I would have got. So can I have an extension? And uh, had a meeting with the head of the department, all these sorts of things. Got. Had a really horrible experience going to this meeting with an HR person, head of department, no one on her side. And the uh, admin said to her, well, you could always come back to work immediately. <laughs> After two weeks. And um, that, that very much coloured her whole view of, of an area in academia, which is, in a way, sort of projects itself as inclusive and, and, uh, and thoughtful about these things. So I just wondered if anyone had any comments about that. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Would anyone else like to share? Hello, uh, Sanjay Gozubayev from Georgia Tech. Good to see you. Um, I wasn't really prepared to share, but I have a question. But I will share a quick story now that I let everybody else start. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel like uh, for for. Uh, 
people who are immigrants or who move to another community with a family. So uh, my wife had to endure a lot of the sort of institutional structures that are sometimes uh, specifically for immigrants that are particularly harmful for women. For example, uh, when I was hired, when I moved, to, when we moved to the United States and we were hired, I was hired, I had a job uh, that I was hired for. But the spouses, the, the visa structure was such that the spouses were not allowed to work. So while Larry wasn't on that visa, she literally could not work for four or five years. So that set her back in her career for, you know, to this day, that's just, you know, 15, 16 years ago. To this day, you know, I feel like she's still trying to catch up because of those lost years of, of career. Uh, my question was uh, about, uh, if you could talk about how that room, how the group came together and also what were the kind of daily experiences of like crafting the stories and reflecting, what are some of the reflective practices that you went through in coming up with that? Thank you. Um, so first, thank you for sharing the story. And I think that there are lots among us in this room um, who would have more stories to share along those lines. Uh, with regards to the question that you asked, um, so we actually came together at a seminar and we decided, and, and every fall I do the seminar, but this year um, we, we try our different formats and this year we try to do a book club. So in the book club we, um, we discuss different books that we would read and then, and so as I mentioned, we read about Abadurai, Culture and Modernity, we, um, um, we read uh, Kandara Jayamba's Geek Heresy and such, and then we read uh, Living a Feminist Life by Sarah Hemad. And that's a really powerful text. And it brought up a lot of questions for us in the room. And uh, there were 18 of us, as I mentioned. And, and there, were, there were lots of questions. There were questions around, well, do we have to be like her? Do we have to um, have you know, those strong uh, sentiments if we really want to be, uh, be able to call ourselves feminist? Like, when am I allowed to be feminist? And so as we were having those discussions, and because I already do uh, feminist research in ACI, uh, we started to read more uh, of the text that at least I was familiar with. And then as we did that, um, you know, we needed a deliverable for the class so that everyone could get a grade. And so we collectively kind of ideated and came together with this idea for a submission that we would write about how our, our experiences with feminism through our lives, um, and as you'll see the, in the other stories, they're also they're very diverse. So how those experiences have shaped us as we are, as ATC researchers, students, uh, faculty, practitioners, so going out in industry or what have you. And, and this is what uh, we came up with. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>